Chapter One of A Popular History of Ireland, Book Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Ireland from the Earliest Period to the Emancipation of the Catholics, Book Three, by Thomas Darcy McGee. Chapter One The Fortunes of the Family of Brian. The last scene of the Irish monarchy, before it entered on the anarchical period, was not destitute of an appropriate grandeur. It was the deathbed scene of the second Malachi, the rival, ally, and successor of the great Brian. After the eventful day at Clomptarf, he resumed the monarchy, without opposition, and for eight years he continued in its undisturbed enjoyment. The fruitful land of Meath again gave forth its abundance, unscourged by the spoiler, and beside its lakes and streams the hospitable Ard Rig had erected, or restored, three hundred fortified houses, where, as his poets sung, shelter was freely given to guests from the king of the elements. His own favourite residence was at Dunnesgeth, the fort of Shields, in the north-west angle of Loch Ennel, in the present parish of Dizart. In the eighth year after Clontarf, the summer of 1022, the Dublin Danes once again ventured on a foray into East Meath, and the aged monarch marched to meet them. At Athboy he encountered the enemy, and drove them, routed and broken, out of the ancient mensal land of the Irish kings. Thirty days after that victory he was called on to confront the conqueror of all men, even death. He had reached the age of seventy-three, and he prepared to meet his last hour with the zeal and humility of a true Christian. To Dunnas Keth repaired Amalgaid, Archbishop of Armagh, the abbots of Clonmacnoise and of Duro, with a numerous train of the clergy. For greater solitude the dying king was conveyed into an island of the lake opposite his fort, then called in his crow, now Cormorant Island, and there, after intense penance, on the fourth of the Nones of September precisely, died Malachi, son of Donald, son of Dunna, in the fond language of the bards, the pillar of the dignity and the nobility of the western world, and the seniors of all Ireland sung masses, hymns, psalms, and canticles for the welfare of his soul. This, says the old translator of the Clonmacnoy's Annals, was the last king of Ireland of Irish blood, that had the crown, yet there were seven kings after without crown, before the coming in of the English. Of these seven subsequent kings we are to write under the general title of the War of Secession. They are called Ardrig go Fresiba, that is, kings opposed or unrecognized by certain tribes or provinces. For it was essential to the completion of the title, as we have before seen, that when the claimant was of Ulster he should have Connaught and Munster, or Leinster and Munster, in his obedience. In other words, he should be able to command the allegiance of two-thirds of his suffragans. If of Munster, he should be equally potent in the other provinces, in order to rank among the recognized kings of Erin. Whether some of the seven kings were subsequent to Malachi the Second, who assumed the title, were not fairly entitled to it, we do not presume to say. It is our simpler task to narrate the incidents of that brilliant war of succession, which occupies almost all the interval between the Danish and Anglo-Norman invasions. The chaunt of the funerary mass of Malachi was hardly heard upon Loch Ennel, when Dunna O'Brien dispatched his agents, claiming the crown from the provincial princes. He was the eldest son of Brian by his second marriage, and his mother was an O'Connor, an additional source of strength to him in the western province. It had fallen to the lot of Dunna and his older brother, Teague, or Thaddeus, to conduct the remnant of the Dalcassians from Clontarf to their home. Marching through Ossory, by the great southern road, they were attacked in their enfeebled state by the lord of that brave little border territory, on whom Brian's hand had fallen with heavy displeasure. Wounded as many of them were, they fought their way desperately towards Cashel, leaving one hundred and fifty men dead in one of their skirmishes. Of all who had left the Shannon side to combat with the enemy, but eight hundred and fifty men lived to return to their homes. No sooner had they reached Kinkora than a fierce dispute arose between the friends of Teague and Dunna as to which should reign over Munster. A battle ensued, with doubtful result, but by the intercession of the clergy this unnatural feud was healed, and the brothers reigned conjointly for nine years afterwards, until Teague fell in an engagement in Eli, Queen's country, 
as was charged and believed by the machinations of his colleague and brother. Thurlug, son of Teague, was the foster-son, and at this time the guest or hostage of Dermot of Leinster, the founder of the McMurrah family, which had now risen into the rank justly forfeited by the traitor Malmurra. When he reached man's age he married the daughter of Dermid, and we shall soon hear of him again asserting in Munster the pretensions of the eldest surviving branch of the O'Brien family. The death of his brother and of Malachi within the same year proved favourable to the ambition of Dunna O'Brien. All Munster submitted to his sway, Connaught was among the first to recognise his title as Ard Rig. Ossory and Leinster, though unwillingly, gave in their adhesion. But Meath refused to recognise him, and placed its government in commission, in the hands of Con O'Loughlin, the arch-poet, and Corcoran, the priest, already more than once mentioned. The country north of Meath obeyed Flattery O'Neill of Eliach, whose ambition, as well as all that of his house, was to restore the northern supremacy, which had continued unbroken, from the fourth to the ninth century. This Flaherty was a vigorous, able, and pious prince, who held stoutly on to the northern half-kingdom. In the year 1030 he made the frequent but adventurous pilgrimage to Rome, from which he is called, in the pedigree of his house, Antrosten, or the cross-bearer. The greatest obstacle, however, to the complete ascendancy of Dunna, arose in the person of his nephew, now advanced to manhood. Thorla O'Brien possessed much of the courage and ability of his grandfather, and he had at his side a faithful and powerful ally in his foster-father, Dermot of Leinster. Rightly or wrongly, on proof or on suspicion, he regarded his uncle as his father's murderer, and he pursued his vengeance with a skill and constancy worthy of Hamlet. At the time of his father's death he was a mere lad, in his fourteenth year. But as he grew older he accompanied his foster-father in all his expeditions, and rapidly acquired a soldier's fame. By marriage with Dervogorl, daughter of the Lord of Ossory, he strengthened his influence at the most necessary point, and what with so good a cause, and such fast friends as he made in exile, his success against his uncle is little to be wondered at. Leinster and Ossory, which had temporarily submitted to Dunna's claim, soon found good pretexts for refusing him tribute, and a border war, marked by all the usual atrocities, raged for several successive seasons. The contest is relieved, however, of its purely civil character, by the capture of Waterford, still Danish, in 1037, and of Dublin in 1051. On this occasion, Dermot of Leinster, bestowing the city on his son Morag, grandfather of Strongbow's ally, to whom the remnant of its inhabitants, as well as their kinsmen in man, submitted for the time with what grace they could. The position of Dunna O'Brien became yearly weaker. His rival had youth, energy, and fortune on his side. The Prince of Connaught finally joined him, and thus a league was formed, which overcame all opposition. In the year 1058 Dunna received a severe defeat at the base of the Galtees, and although he went into the house of O'Connor the same year, and humbly submitted to him, it only postponed his day of reckoning. Three years after O'Connor took Kinkora, and Dermot of Leinster burned Limerick, and took hostages as far southward as St. Brendan's Hill, Trolley. The next year Dunna O'Brien, then fully fourscore years of age, weary of life and of the world, took the cross staff, and departed on a pilgrimage to Rome, where he died soon after in the monastery of St. Stephen. It is said by some writers that Dunna brought with him to Rome, and presented to the Pope, Alexander the Second, the crown of his father, and from this tradition many theories and controversies have sprung. It is not unlikely that a deposed monarch should have carried into exile whatever portable wealth he still retained, nor that he should have presented his crown to the sovereign pontiff before finally quitting the world. But as to conferring with the crown the sovereignty of which it was once an emblem, neither reason nor religion obliges us to believe any such hypothesis. Dermot of Leinster, upon the banishment of Dunna, son of Brian, A.D. 1063, became actual ruler of the southern half-kingdom and nominal Ard Rig, with opposition. The twofold antagonism to this prince came, as might be expected, from Connor, son of Malachi, the head of the southern Hainial dynasty, and from the chiefs of the elder dynasty of the north. Thorlog O'Brien, now king of Cashel, loyally repaid, by his devoted adherents, the deep debt he owed in his struggles and his early youth to Dermot. 
There are few instances in our annals of a more devoted friendship than existed between these brave and able princes through all the chances of a half-century. No one act seems to have broken through the lifelong intimacy of Dermot and Thurla. No cloud ever came between them, no mistrust, no distrust. Rare and precious felicity of human experience! How many myriads of men have sighed out their souls in vain desire for that best blessing which heaven can bestow, a true, unchanging, unsuspecting friend! To return, Conor O'Megleglin could not see, without deep-seated discontent, a prince of Leinster assume the rank which his father and several of his ancestors had held. A border strife between Meath and Leinster arose not unlike that which had been waged a few years before for the deposition of Dunna, between Leinster and Ossory on the one part, and Munster on the other. Various were the encounters, whose obscure details are seldom preserved to us. But the good fortune of Dermid prevailed in all, until, in the year 1070, he lost Morog, his heir, by a natural death at Dublin, and Gleniarn, another son, fell in battle with the men of Meath. Two years later, in the Battle of Ova in the same territory, and against the same enemy, Dermid himself fell, with the Lord of Forth, and a great host of Dublin Danes and Leinster men. The triumph of the son of Malachi, and the sorrow and anger of Leinster, are equally great. The bards have sung the praise of Dermid in strains which history accepts. They praise his ruddy aspect and laughing teeth, they remember how he upheld the standard of war, and none dared contend with him in battle. They denounce vengeance on Meath as soon as his death-feast is over, a vengeance too truly pursued. As a picture of the manners and habits of thought in those times, the fate of Connor, son of Melagan, and its connection with the last illness and death of Thorlog O'Brien are worthy of mention. Connor was treacherously slain, the year after the Battle of Ova, in a parley with his own nephew, though the parley was held under the production of Baxal Issa, or Staff of Christ, the most revered relic of the Irish Church. After his death his body was buried in the great church of Clonmacnoise, in his own patrimony. But Thorlog O'Brien, perhaps, from his friendship for Dermid, carried off his head, as the head of an enemy, to Kinkora. When it was placed in his presence in his palace, a mouse ran out from the dead man's head, and under the king's mantle, which occasioned him such a fright that he grew suddenly sick, his hair fell off, and his life was despaired of. It was on Good Friday that the buried head was carried away, and on Easter Sunday it was tremblingly restored again, with two rings of gold as a peace-offering to the church. Thus were God and St. Kieran vindicated. Thorlog O'Brien slowly regained his strength, though Keating, and the authors he followed, think he was never the same man again, after the fright he received from the head of Conor O'Megleglen. He died peaceably, and full of penitence, at Kinkora, on the eve of the Ides of July, A.D. 1086, after severe physical suffering. He was in the seventy-seventh year of his age, the thirty-second of his rule over Munster, and the thirteenth since the death of Dermot of Leinster, in his actual sovereignty of the southern half, and nominal rule of the whole kingdom. He was succeeded by his son Murkertok, or Murtog, afterwards called Mor, or the Great. We have thus traced to the third generation the political fortunes of the family of Brian, which includes so much of the history of those times. That family had become, and was long destined to remain, the first in rank and influence in the southern half-kingdom. But internal discord in a great house, as in a great state, is fatal to the peaceable transmission of power. That acknowledged right of birth to which a famous historian attributes the peaceful successions of modern Europe, was too little respected in those ages, in many countries of Christendom, and had no settled prescription in its favour among the Irish. Primogeniture, and the whole scheme of feudal dependence, seems to have been an essential preparative for modern civilization. But as Ireland had escaped the legions of Rome, so she existed without the circle of feudal organization. When that system did at length appear upon her soil, it was embodied in an invading host, and patriot zeal could discern nothing good, nothing imitable, in the laws and customs of an enemy, whose armed presence in the land was an insult to its inhabitants. Thus did our island twice lose the discipline which elsewhere laid the foundation of great states, once in the Roman, and again in the feudal era. End of chapter 1